Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, you're very welcome to today's Irish Studies Seminar. Um, as usual, we have an audience uh, online through Teams and with uh, audience here in the in the room as well. <clears throat> so um, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome today's speaker, who's uh, Dr. James Quinn. Uh, no, some people in the room, James uh, is a former editor um, of the Dictionary of Irish Biography, which a project he joined in 1995, and um, which he played a key role leading uh, in, in the lead up to its launch in 2009. Uh, in 2012, he was uh, the DIB's managing editor uh, until his uh, retirement in July 2022. Uh, he's uh, written more than 270 entries for the dictionary. Um, and also written uh, more kind of long form uh, biographical studies uh, of uh, well known Irish and nationalist figures, uh, including the United Irishman Thomas Russell in 2002 and the young Irelander John Mitchell in 2008. He's also published a study of the writings of the young Irelanders, Young Ireland and the Writing of Irish History in 2015. Uh, and Jim's most recent book uh, is. Um, a study of uh, association football in Ireland, no foreign game, association football and the making of Irish identities published by Irish Academic Press in 2023. Uh, it's a very accessible uh, and a very impressive study uh, of not just of the, uh, of, of the kind of sporting history of, of football in Ireland, but also of its uh, relationship with political and national identities. And that's the subject he's going to speak to us about today, specifically uh, the issue of Irish soccer and the rhetoric of unity, 1973 to 93, where did it all go wrong? So James, very welcome. Thank That's you, it. Peter. Thanks thanks for all that. Um, and thank you all for, for coming here on this beautiful uh, spring afternoon. Um, it's uh, quite a while since I've been in Queens, so it's, it's nice to be back here again. So thank you to the Institute of Irish Studies and, and to Peter for the invitation to speak. Okay, well, look, one of, the, one of the reasons why I was attracted to write a book on Irish soccer is that its history has more than just sporting significance. Perhaps because its most dedicated supporters were generally to be found in the same working class communities who are usually in the front lines of political protest, it has often replicated the divisions of wider society. This was clearly the case with the split in Irish soccer that was initiated in 1921. For those outside Ireland, the existence of two separate international soccer teams from the mid-1920s was one of the most visible signs of political partition. Foreign observers, who mostly had only a vague understanding of the precise level of national sovereignty of the Irish Free State, gained a greater appreciation of its political independence when they saw its football team play against continental powers such as Italy, Hungary and Germany, <coughs> in the interwar period. In contrast, the IFA senior team concentrated almost solely on the British Championship and did not play a full international against continental opposition until 1951. All too often, the partition of Irish soccer is seen as a lamentable and avoidable development that disadvantaged both parties and cried out for resolution. What is rather less appreciated is that by freeing the FAI from the dominance of the UK football associations, it also offered considerable opportunities for national self-assertion. The fact that the FAI team was able to participate in the earliest FIFA competitions was of real importance in securing greater official recognition for a sport regarded by some in government and state bodies as at odds with the Gaelic ethos of an independent Ireland. Some of the official distaste or indifference towards soccer eased when the FAI demonstrated that its national team could fly the flag for the new state and alert the rest of Europe to the fact that it was a genuinely independent polity separate from the UK. As was often the case in politics, the exercise of sovereignty took precedence over the constraints and compromises of unity. For the Belfast-based IFA, to an even greater extent, unity was never the first item on its agenda. It viewed the FEI as an illegal secessionist body and assumed that, starved of international recognition and competition, it would in time come to its senses and seek reunification. 
The IFA's international status was not seriously affected by the secession. Its close links with the other UK associations continued, and it participated annually in the British Championship, which it regarded as the world's most prestigious competition. Furthermore, its international team was in no way weakened by the split, and until 1950 included players, players born in the tw 26 counties as before. Now, given the mixed fortunes of both teams after 1950, it was not surprising that some players, supporters and journalists argued that it made sense to combine the playing resources of two small countries who often struggled to compete at international level. Even when Northern Ireland qualified for the 1958 World Cup and reached the quarterfinals, some wondered just how far the team might have gone had they been able to call on talented FAI internationals such as Noel Cantwell, Charlie Hurley, and Dermot Curtis. Such calls continued throughout the 1960s and early 70s, when it often appeared that each team was short of four or five players of genuine international standard, and merging their resources would enable them to field a truly competitive international 11. Politics too played its part. Relations between North and South steadily improved throughout the 1960s, as Lamas and O'Neill had several cordial meetings in which they laid, laid the foundations for future cooperation. These plans were, however, interrupted by the outbreak of widespread civil disorder in the late 1960s. As violence and the death toll mounted, some wondered if sport could make a greater contribution to easing tensions and antagonisms. Among them was Derek Dugan, by then a, ver a veteran Northern Ireland international and one of the leading personalities in the English game. Unlike most professional footballers, Dugan was not averse to speaking out on political and social issues and had several platforms to do so. He was a vocal chairman of the English Professional Footballers Association, a well-known pundit on ITV, and wrote several books scathingly critical of those who ran the game. He himself came from an East Belfast unionist background but had observed how Irish professional footballers from North and South got on well together in England and believed that this goodwill could be harnessed. In early 1973, he and John Giles, the outstanding figure on the FEI international team, managed to secure a match in Dublin between an All-Ireland selection and the world champions, Brazil. When Dugan sounded out official support for the match, he received a cool response from the influential IFA president, Harry Cavan, who as a FIFA vice president, was one of the most powerful administrators in world football. A strong defender of the IFA's autonomy, Cavan was wary of any moves to all, towards All-Ireland unity and neither publicly supported nor opposed the match. It also seems that the FEI, which had not been involved in organizing the match, had its own reservations. Dugan and Giles nevertheless managed to put together an all-Ireland all team to face Brazil at Lansdowne Road on 3rd of July, 1973. Calling the team Ireland risked further complications and instead it lined out in green and white hoops as a Shamrock Rovers 11 and adopted a nation once again as its anthem. <laughs> In an exciting game, televised live on RTE, the makeshift Irish team provided a stiff test for the Brazilians, losing 4-3 in front of an appreciative crowd of 34,000. Now, Irish sport has often been mocked for its readiness to clutch at moral victories, but there was something to celebrate here. The game was a rare shaft of light in a dark period, and the public and press responded with enthusiasm. The Irish Times proclaimed Brazilians rocked by United Irishmen. If a scratch 11 could put up such a strong performance against the world champions, it seemed obvious that an official All-Ireland team could do even better. Team manager Liam Tuohy, a man not, not normally given to hyperbole, optimistically maintained that, quote, an, an All-Ireland team could take on any team in the world and beat them. On the northern side, too, there was strong support. Goalkeeper Pat Jennings was convinced 
that a 32 county team was now a viable proposition that should be seriously pursued. Such euphoria and expectations prompted the two associations to discuss pooling their playing resources at conferences in 1973 and 1974. But there was, as we all know, rather little progress. Uh, by this time, they'd been separated for over half a century and had developed distinct structures, priorities and identities. In retrospect, their discussions seem to have been largely a public relations exercise. By the mid 70s, most IFA, IFA officials saw the border as a bulwark rather than a barrier and were determined to maintain their autonomy in football as in politics. After he broached the prospect of an All-Ireland team with the IFA, Dugan never again played for Northern Ireland and was convinced that his selection had been vetoed by senior officials. Whether or not this is true, it is instructive to consider just how little progress was made. The two sides could not even agree to commission a report to examine the viability of an All-Ireland team or set up a standing committee to investigate the matter for, further. The usual half measures re resorted to by administrators when they wish to appear to be doing something. Relations between the two associations remained polite but distant, and they usually had as little to do with each other as possible. Indeed, it would be 1999 before the two, asso two associations could even arrange a friendly match between their full international teams when they finally met in Dublin to raise funds for the victims of the 1998 Oma bombing. Because of this, official inertia has generally been seen as the main barrier to progress. Officials were, of course, well aware that greater unity might entail sweeping administrative changes, including a need for fewer officials. And since the negotiations were carried out by those who had most to lose, it was perhaps no great surprise that they made little headway. This was very much the attitude taken by most players, journalists and supporters who favoured a 32 county team. Now this clearly contains some truth, but the story is rather more complicated than simply one of administrative self-interest. If, for example, we look at the contention that international players from north and south overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly supported the idea of a 32 county team, the evidence is far from conclusive. Some Northern Ireland players from a nationalist background were clearly in favour of unity, but most were decidedly reticent on the subject, particularly during their playing careers. And as for players from a unionist background, there seemed to have been relatively few who shared Dugan's enthusiasm for unity. Brian Hamilton, for example, who played in the match against Brazil, later made clear that he was far more attracted by the prospect of playing the world champions than of laying the foundations for an All-Ireland team. Danny Blanchflower, particularly during his time as Northern Ireland manager in the late 70s, was another who was lukewarm about the prospects of unity believing that the disruption and controversy involved would outweigh the advantage of being able to select from a wider pool of players. And in terms of supporters, while many Southern supporters were well disposed towards the prospect of a 32 county team, this sentiment was largely aspirational and was rarely expressed with any great commitment. It's noteworthy, for example, that it had produced no organizations, campaigns, protests, or any real attempt to put pressure on the FAI. As for Northern Ireland supporters, most were either unenthusiastic or strongly opposed. Harry Cavan put it bluntly when tentative negotiations with the FAI broke down in 1980, declaring that, quote, the plain truth of the matter is that the people of Northern Ireland do not want an All-Ireland team, and we are acting on their behalf. The divided nature of Irish soccer was thrown into sharp focus when the two teams met for the first time in a European cha Championship qualifier at Lansdowne Road on 20th of September 1978. Amid fears that such a match might be accompanied by crowd trouble, 
or even paramilitary violence, there was little celebration. One commentator described it as, quote, the worst thing that could possibly happen to soccer in this country. By this time, the Northern conflict had lost some of the murderous intensity that had prevented the playing of international matches in Belfast up to 1975. But violence still continued, claiming over 400 lives in the two previous years. An estimated 8,000 Northern Ireland supporters traveled to Dublin and Gardaí mounted the largest security operation ever seen in the city for a sports event. The two managers, Danny Blanchler and John Giles, went out of their way to downplay the match's significance and the only national anthem played by agreement was Aron Levine. Inside the ground, the atmosphere was tense, but mostly peaceful, although afterwards there were scuffles and stone throwing incidents around Lansdowne Road, quelled only by a guard of Vatten charge. The game itself was a dour nil-nil draw that failed to match the fixture's historic significance. Both teams seemed rather intimidated by the occasion and played within themselves. Liam Brady, for example, found it, quote, stupid and senseless that two Irish teams were trying to deny each other the opportunity to qualify for an international tournament. At the time, he was playing for Arsenal, a team that regularly featured six Irishmen, three from the north and three from the south, and insisted that if they could play together effectively and harmoniously for their club, there was no reason why they could not do so for their, for their country. Now, of the two main arguments made for a United team, one was symbolic and the other was practical. The symbolic argument was that the political differences between Irishmen could be eased by fielding a team that represented the entire island. This was an argument never likely to cut much ice with unionists, who had little interest in cross-border symbols of unity or saw them as the thin end of the United Ireland wedge. The practical argument was perhaps more promising. By pooling their resources, these two small, underachieving soccer nations would produce a stronger team that could qualify more readily for international tournaments and give both sets of supporters something to cheer about. After all, at the IFA's annual meeting in 1979, even Harry Cavan surprised his colleagues by declaring that having, quote, two teams in a small country like this was nonsensical. In the right circumstances, i.e. the continued underperformance of both teams, the practical argument might have gained some support, but it was soon to be overtaken by events. In March 1980, Billy Bingham became Northern Ireland manager for the second time and would remain in charge for the next 13 years. Under his leadership, the team enjoyed its greatest period of su sustained success, winning the British Championship outright in 1980 and 84 and qualifying for the 1982 and 86 World Cups. During the 82 tournament in Spain, the team performed well above expectations, beating the host country, advancing into the second round, and generally impressing observers with their team spirit and attacking football. Four years later, they qualified again, and although they could not quite repeat the heroics of 82, they still performed creditably. Harry Cavan no doubt reflected the attitude of most Northern Ireland supporters when he remarked that with such achievements, who needs a United Irish soccer team? Well, when he made that remark, the answer from many players and supporters south of the border could well have been, we do. But this too was soon to change. Under the management of Jack Charlton, the Republic qualified for the 1988 European Championship, where it performed above expectations and came within a whisker of making the semi-finals. It soon built on this achievement and went on to emulate Northern Ireland by qualifying for successive World Cups in 1990 and 94, reaching the quarterfinals in the former and the second round in the latter. In doing so, the team inspired unprecedented levels of communal pride and celebration and a level of enthusiastic national solidarity probably never seen before in the history of the Irish state. Now, as we all know, to qualify for the 94 tournament, the Republic needed to secure at least a draw against Northern Ireland at Windsor Park on 17th of November, 1993. 
in what would prove to be one of the most notorious matches ever played on Irish, Irish soil. This provided a vivid illustration of the game's capacity to unleash pent-up tensions and deep-seated tribalism, and for many Southerners contrasted sharply with the joyful celebrations associated with the Republic's previous success. It was a fixture that could not have come at a worse time. Peace negotiations by John Hume, Gerry Adams, and the British and Irish governments were moving towards a conclusion, aggravating long-standing unionist fears that the British government might abandon them. While the negotiations proceeded, so too did the violence. The year had already seen dozens of killings, when on Saturday, 23rd of October, the IRA exploded a bomb at a fish shop on the Shankill Road and killed 10 people. A week later, members of the Ulster of the Loyalist Ulster Freedom Fighters entered the Rising Sun Bar in Grey Steel and sprayed it with gunfire, killing eight customers. Although the sporting context bears no comparison to such atrocities, it too added to the edge. By November 93, Northern Ireland had no chance of reaching the World Cup, but knew that victory over their neighbours would prevent them from doing so. Never before in all their previous meetings had the teams played for such high stakes. They had met earlier in Dublin in March 93 in a one-sided game which the Republic won 3-0. This had passed off peacefully, but as their team coasted to an easy victory, the chant of there's only one team in Ireland by the Republic supporters had rankled with their opponents who eagerly awaited the return. Billy Bingham made little secret of the fact that, he, that he'd been hurt by the defeat, boldly stating, I want revenge for it, and stoking tensions by describing the Republic's team as full of mercenaries. With this confluence of political and sporting tensions, a pre-match FAI report predicted that the Republic, quote, may expect a hostile reception, and the association declined to take up its ticket allocation and advised supporters not to travel. The match attracted an attendance of 10,000 supporters, policed by, by about 1,000 RUC officers. Long before kickoff, sectarian songs and chants echoed around Windsor Park, including some that mocked the victims of the Grey Steel shootings, and Bingham was seen to whip up an already partisan crowd. The game itself was played in a tense and, and antagonistic atmosphere, with all of the Republic's players roundly abused. Even though the game ended in a draw that allowed the Republic to equal Northern Ireland's achievement and qualify for successive World Cups, celebrations were muted. The Republic's players and few supporters present were taken aback at the level of hostility experienced. The Irish News described it as, quote, a night of shame for Irish soccer, while another paper reported that the game, quote, laid bare for 90 minutes or so the horrible undercurrents of poisonous sectarian emotions that have been tearing at Northern Ireland for generations. It was a deeply depressing night for most Irish soccer supporters and is generally remembered as the nadir in sporting relations between North and South. However, I think it would be a mistake to see it as defining the complex relationship that existed between the two Irish football communities for over 70 years. Throughout that time, their attitudes to each other had often been ambivalent, mutable, and contradictory, and even at times reasonably friendly. The intensity of the bigotry expressed on that November night was very much of its own time and place, stoked by a combustible mixture of sporting rivalry, ethno-sectarian animosity, and fearful political uncertainty. Any narrative, that would see, any narrative that would see the prospects of unity in Irish soccer looming large in 1973 before finally succumbing to a fatal blow 20 years later would be a simplistic one. Rather, I think it's the case that both the optimism of 1973 and the disillusionment of 1993 owed more to ephemeral emotion than to hard fact. With the Republic's successes of 1988 to 1990, calls for an All-Ireland team had already grown much fainter long before the Windsor Park match. 
and were usually given voice by politicians or well-meaning observers who had only a passing interest or understanding of the game. These years also saw increasing numbers of Northern nationalists supporting the Republic's team. Some undoubtedly with reservations, but they still formed a vocal and committed element in the team's following. In the years that followed, partly in keeping with the rather more permissive attitude to national identity enshrined in the Good Friday Agreement, increasing numbers of players from nationalist backgrounds born in Northern Ireland began to play for the Republic. In 2007, Darren Gibson became the first player born in Northern Ireland to play for the Republic since 1946. And in subsequent years, he was joined by others such as Mark Wilson, James McLean and Shane Duffy. The effect of this has been to provide Northern Nationalists with a team they can more readily support and dilute calls for a merger between the IFA and FAI within that community. No other sport mirrors political developments quite like soccer in Ireland. In both, some see partition as a natural development that reflects divided allegiances, while others see it as a lamentable aberration that further entrenches division and argue that unity is a natural, natural and sensible solution that can be achieved through negotiation and goodwill. Such optimism has, however, sometimes shaded into wishful thinking with a tendency to gloss over the divisions that prompted the split in the first place. The decision of the Leinster FA to secede from the IFA in 1921 was no opportunistic tantrum, but one based on deep-seated differences, some sporting, others political and cultural. Chief among them was national identity. The Leinster FA believed that the IFA essentially represented a British rather than an Irish national identity. And this was something they were unwilling to accept at a time when separatist nationalism had widespread public support in most of Ireland. And if nationalists initiated the split, its logic was soon accepted by unionists and it remained solidly in place because it offered both sides opportunities for national self-assertion that would probably have torn all island, all island structures apart. During the unity negotiations of the 1970s, this, it seems, was far more readily accepted by Northerners than by Southerners. The former often despairing of the attitude that unity could be decreed without taking into account the bitter divisions in Northern Ireland and on the island as a whole. By the 1970s, it was also the fact that the main interest groups in Irish soccer were generally content with the status quo. Chief among them were the two main domestic leagues and their senior clubs, North and South, even if in comparison with the national associations, the domestic leagues had at least kept open lines of communication with regular representative matches. In the absence of international fixtures, these interleague contests were eagerly anticipated, and the first at Dalyman Park in March 1926 was attended by 18,000 spectators. During the Second World War, the two leagues met 11 times, sometimes attracting crowds of over 30,000. A generally friendly spirit prevailed during these games, with the fact that the teams represented different leagues rather than different states toning down their national significance. They met regularly thereafter, usually at least once a year until 1970, when the Troubles intervened. Resumed in the 1980s and 90s, they sparked little interest, and the last of their 60 matches was played on the 1st of November, the year 2000, before a mere 350 spectators at Terryland Park in Galway. The history of cross-border club, club competitions has been similarly fitful but perhaps retains greater potential for future cooperation between North and South. The situation in soccer can seem so anomalous because Ireland is represented by a single national team in most other sports. Advocates of unity particularly invoke the example of rugby, arguing that if rugby can successfully field a team that straddles two jurisdictions, then there is no reason that soccer cannot do the same. The history of soccer and rugby in Ireland are, though, rather different, 
with significant variations between most of those who played, watched, and ran the two games. For the first half century or so of its existence, most of the leading officials of the IRFU, North and South, were upper class, Protestant, often Protestant, and Unionist. It was broadly accepted that the IRFU's headquarters should be in Dublin and that international matches be played at the Union's spacious stadium at Lansdowne Road. The International Selection Committee was broadly based, and most Irish rugby 15s usually featured a good mix of players from North and South, which ensured that their selection produced little of the rancor seen in soccer prior to 1921. It also helped that the IRFU's main all-island focus was on the national team. Unlike the pre-split IFA, it did not run all-Ireland club competitions. Instead, the four provincial unions administered their own club tournaments, a situation that persisted until 1990, which avoided the, the worst of the recurrent friction and recrimination that eventually frayed the bonds between North and South in soccer. There were, of course, occasional differences of opinion among those who administered rugby, but these differences were usually resolved by like-minded men who shared many of the same sporting, social, and cultural values. There was little such fellow feeling in soccer, whose history was replete with many examples of discord and even violence. During the Home Rule Crisis of 1912 to 14, the serious crowd trouble, including the discharging of firearms, seen in Belfast at matches between clubs with unionist and nationalist followings was unthinkable in rugby or indeed in any other sport. Regular disputes aggravated the administrative and geographic tensions caused by the, locations, by the location of soccer's headquarters outside the capital, an arrangement unique in Irish sport. Southerners claimed that they were discriminated against in terms of selection for the national team and the allocation of international fixtures to Dublin. In the club game too, a series of administrative <coughs> disputes in which the IFA clearly favored Northern clubs brought matters to a head in 1921. While the petition of the island set in motion by the Government of Ireland Act was not the direct cause of the split between the Dublin and Belfast football authorities, and I think Cormac Moore has made that very clear in his book, it nonetheless clearly influenced it, providing the aggrieved Leinster FA, Leinster FA with an example and opportunity to resolve its fractious sporting relationship with Belfast. This ensured that there was always a political as well as a sporting background to the split, and that would make it all the more intractable. Initially, as we saw, the violence of the Troubles provided some impetus for moves towards unity. But its continuation for over a quarter of a century in Northern Ireland tended to reinforce sectarian polarization and stoke further opposition to an all-Ireland team. While the 1998 Belfast Agreement sought to provide a basis for political cooperation, it reflected the uneasy compromises and entrenched differences of Northern society, rather than any newfound unity. Trust between political opponents remained in short supply, and cooperation was fitful and easily derailed. And I probably could have used the, the present tense there, uh, is fitful and easily derailed. Mm -hmm. Working class Protestants in particular believed that they were steadily losing ground to nationalists and felt increasingly alienated. In an uncertain political landscape, supporting a Northern Ireland football team whose symbols and culture reflected a solely British identity was of central importance to those who wished to maintain Northern Ireland's autonomy. And celebration of the team's achievements as a doughty underdog featured widely, widely on murals and in, in other representations of Protestant unionist culture. Well, as for the future, creating an All-Ireland team without committed support from followers of both current teams would invite a whole new range of problems. Even if the likely difficulties over contested symbols such as flags and anthems could be overcome, and it should be borne in mind that these symbols are invested in a sporting context 
with an even greater emotional charge than usual. It is likely the fault lines would remain and come strongly to the fore if the team's fortunes suffered. It is worth remembering that selecting a team from both sides of the, of the border was never a guarantee of success. In 1948 to 49, the last two years when this was done, the team's record was played six, lost six, scored eight, and conceded 30. <laughs> Some commentators have suggested that unity in Irish football can only come about after a political solution to partition. And in recent years, demographic and political changes have given heart to those who aspire to a united Ireland. However, although the structures of soccer are clearly influenced by the wider political context, they do not necessarily depend on it. There is no guarantee that a political solution to Irish unity, which perhaps would involve some kind of federal arrangement, would automatically lead to a 32 county soccer team. As things stand, it would seem that support for the prospect is mostly rather aspirational and half-hearted, while opposition is still strongly entrenched. If it is ever to be realistic, a great deal of work would have to be done to undo the effects of a hundred years of partition. During the 1940s, players such as Jackie Carey and Con Martin were sometimes criticized in the South for being mercenary or unpatriotic in turning out for the IFA team. <coughs> but a case can be made that they were doing more than their absolutist critics, whose rhetoric was that of unity, but whose punct punctilious actions invariably drove the two sides further apart. As with Irish unity in political, social and economic matters, the way forward for advocates of Irish soccer unity would seem to be one of starting the courtship rather than making immediate plans for the wedding. Thank you. Thanks. James, thank you very much. Um, so we've time for questions. Uh, so we can take questions obviously from the room. Uh, also people online, um, if you want to ask a question, just raise your hand digitally um, or type a question into the chat box and, uh, and Luke will um, alert us to that. So let's, let's open it up to the, the room first. Who'd like to ask the first question? Eamon. Um, I mean, you used the word mercenary twice, or you quoted it and you used twice. Yeah. Which always seems to be an odd term to use yeah. in relationship to soccer, because one of the distinctions between it and the other major sporting associations is professionalism, yeah, yeah. which in its turn is tied to that class issue that yeah. you touched on. Yeah. I wonder if you, if you want to say something a bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, it, it, um, Jackie Curry certainly gave his justification for appearing for Northern Ireland as, as saying that um, soccer was his profession and he had uh, he would take any opportunity to exercise his profession and no one would stand in the way. Um, I think there was more to it than that. I, I, I think particularly he and Martin um, were doing their best to keep lines of communication open. They were personally very friendly with a lot of the Northern Ireland players and, and officials and they did so. But um yeah i mean i think it can be it's a it's a ready jibe isn't it when when people um you know and let's be honest criticism in in soccer is not always fair i mean um, <laughs> so 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 yeah it, it, it's a curious one and um yeah i i think that the most notorious example though is when billy bingham used it in in 93 and uh, which I think did stoke tension somewhat. No, no, let's not exaggerate it, but somewhat. And perhaps doesn't actually appreciate because it was something I appreciated in, in writing the book, just how much it meant to so many players from an Irish background um, to play for, particularly for the Republic, because that was obviously much more, uh, had a far greater representation um of english-born players and I, I think it very much shows that you know uh, nationality has an an ethnic as well as a territorial dimension that so many people are or are brought up in irish communities in england feel a strong attachment so um i think that was, that was one of the things i would have appreciated much more um in the research i did for the book yeah. 
Um, the focus here is obviously mostly on senior men's team, mm. and I'm just wondering, if it, uh, do we see different things at different levels? Say, for example, was there ever a suggestion of an All Ireland Olympic team under the Olympic Council of Ireland, or were we just maybe not good enough to even consider that? Well, I suppose the other one is women's team, yeah, which yeah. has grown a lot. And uh, towards the end of last year, we had the um, Republic women's team played in Windsor Park. Yeah. The Caron yeah. Levine was played deep yeah. lost on the train in Windsor Park. Hasn't fallen down as a result. <laughs> um, underage. I know the mercenary thing had something to do with the uh, Republic poaching the underage players that the North had, the Northern Ireland had developed. So I'm just wondering if you had a chance to look at other um, categories of the game outside the men's senior team and if you saw anything else there. Yeah, I mean. I just say the talk was very much based on on, on the men's senior team. Um, information on the other areas is I, I picked that I think because it's the most symbolic. You know, it, it, it's it's the one that I think grabs people in the gut, in in a way. Now I think that's going to happen in the women's game, and it's already happening in the women's game. But um, in a way, the templates are set really in in the the seventies, eighties, when you know international women's football. Is still grossly underfunded and basically rarely features in, in the media and so on. Um, I was actually thinking of, of the mention of the Olympic team. I, I think is is an interesting one. I was actually thinking of that as I was making my way here. That if if, if the IFA and FA wanted to tentatively proceed, that you know putting together maybe um, an All Ireland Olympic team from the Irish League and the, the League of Ireland might be a way uh, of doing that, you know, um, without frightening the, the general horses so much. And in a way that that's what I, I, they, I think, are the kind of steps that that have to be taken, you know, um, before you before you can do that. Um, and that step by step approach, I think, will probably promise more than. Because the with the senior men international teams, there's so much baggage and history there, and it's almost with them it, that's trying to do the most difficult thing first. You know? And so I, I think some of the points you make there about, it, about the Olympic team. Um, so the current state of finance and administration in the FAI isn't helping anything, mm -hmm. any either. No, no, but it, it, it's probably... It's on, the, it's on the front page of the newspaper, it's not good news. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, yeah, I mean, they, they you know, had an, an almost existential crisis a few years back. So if you're a, an IFA official, you're sitting back with your arms <laughs> folded and, and saying, we'll wait till that, uh, that works out, you know? So, um, yeah, I mean, look, the barriers to football unity in, in this country are immense. You know, when you have two organizations that have been apart for over 100 years, you get that degree of administrative inertia anyway. Um, they are immense. That's why I think that your, your point about the Olympic team is, is well made. Um, they, they're the kind of small steps that maybe they, they should be looking at. James? I was just uh, wondering, you know, very interesting point about obviously national allegiance, as you say, is key to this yeah. issue. I just wonder how you react to the idea that actually ownership of a sense of Irishness paradoxically helped solidify the division of football in this island. That the northern team is actually surrounded by Irish iconography. Mm. Danny Blanchard mm -hmm. managed the team that he still called Ireland yeah, in the yeah, 70s. Yeah, yeah. Whilst I think previously an advocate for a UK team yeah. and talk about unifying yeah. <laughs> different administrations or different uh, jurisdictions. So just wonder about how you think Irish identity fits into the survival of uh, of this division. Yeah, I mean the the naming thing is really, really interesting in, in that people with a, a generally unionist outlook um, call their team Ireland. Until about the 1970s, when, when um, the 32 county implications of that start uh, dawning on people, and um, they they you get the the team being called Northern Ireland, and again it, it's symbols though are, are what you make of them, aren't they? You know, um, you know, the colour green in and of itself doesn't necessarily have to have a, a massive 
massive significance. It's what you make of that color green, you know. Um, and it's, I think I made the point in the talk that, you know, unionism mightn't have initiated the split, but it accepted its logic pretty quickly. And it accepted its logic because it got most of the things it, it wanted. So it had the attachment to, you know, still the, the Celtic cross badge, the Ireland team wearing green shorts. Um, and so it got everything it wanted out of that. So in, in a way, it could almost diffuse those kind of symbols because they they served their own purpose. Yeah. Jim, um, great. more about the interaction between the international game and the club game. You, you did raise yeah, that. Yeah. You know, one one uh, example sprung to mind when you were talking uh, of the uh, Linfield and the Dock in '79. Yeah. Goes forward on the mother of my past. Yeah, 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 yeah. Happenings at the time, and from what you were saying, that maybe was a key juncture. And uh, it would seem that perhaps for taking in the South too somewhat, given all the mayhem that surrounded that fixture. Yeah. And then in contrast, I suppose you've got the peace process, post peace peace process context, the Satanta Cup. Yeah. yeah. Later on, which, yeah. which seemed to be played in a very good spirit. Yeah. I yeah. feel they then went down to Dublin for the final, mm. no trouble or very little. Um, so maybe this this interaction that you know. A more key aspect to it than perhaps. Yeah, I, I actually was going to do add something more on on the clubs, but I I, I didn't want to get the, the level of detail in the uh, talk too too granular or whatever. Um, yeah, there's there's promise there, and but at at the same time, all Ireland tournaments have have come to an end because of crowd trouble as well. Um, and teams tend to lose interest in them after about three or four years as well. Um, they tend to start off where everyone's a bit curious to see how they're going to measure up, and then they they, they fall away. And uh, yeah, isn't it the, the the main one that would be the Unite, um, the one promoted by the Unite um, Trade Union, where they have the league leaders play each other, you know? But I mean, th even those games, they've been, you know, um, there are banners there to, you know, celebrate the difference, you know. And I think it was it was a Dundalk and Limfield met and match, and so they celebrated the difference by trading sectarian chants and things like that. So <laughs> you you can't become too starry-eyed about it. But again, if if we're going to look at baby steps and taking steps, I I think that's that's the way forward, you know. Um, through through the club game. Maybe uniting the two leagues under a federal structure or something like that. I think that's much more promising than if you, as I say, going for the the great prize of getting the two international teams together. The calendar's there a problem because mm. the Irish, yeah. the League of Ireland, is a summer mm. game, and the Irish League. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. Discussions here to move to summer, the summer yeah. game as well. That was yeah. always an issue with the Satanta. Yeah. Cup that the um, the League of Ireland team would be primed, yeah, and I think the Northern team started the march, yeah, yeah, doing as well, and the same with the European stuff. So I mean, you'd have to even agree on a calendar, of course. You would, you would, but it's 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 not entirely impossible, you know. It's it, um, you know, and I suppose the 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 domestic game seems to be on a bit of a an upward curve anyway. So. Maybe that's just embarrassing to be a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps so. But um, it seems to be on, a, on an upward curve. And I think when it is on an upward curve and standards are improving, then people are more inclined to maybe attend matches between cross-border clubs and see how they measure up against each other and so on. You know? Yes, question in the back. <laughs> this is kind of bringing up the present day, but as we see more young players, male athletes now yeah. kind of getting into the senior international setup, that you know the players are maybe born after the good part of the agreement, yeah. you know, Connor Bradley, who's from a national spark one yeah. who's playing for Northern Ireland. You know, do you think that as identity kind of shifts up here and we have maybe more people from kind of you know different backgrounds and maybe more little around kind of 
you know, merging in Northern Irish politics, do you think that that could kind of impact attitudes towards what, you know, what team people from here would choose to represent? You know, do you think maybe we might see more people from sort of a more nationalist background or at least go yeah, back to yeah. generations? Do you think we'll see more people <coughs> from those kind of backgrounds maybe just saying, well, I'll play for Northern Ireland because it's close, you know, proximity yeah. to Bacchus, do you think we'll see maybe a bit of a shift in that? And is someone like Conor Bradley just maybe start that? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, players from a nationalist background have always played for Northern Ireland, and often, you know, a lot of them are very proud of it, but they're not just doing it because it's, you know, the option available. A lot, so, you know, Conor Bradley is, is, is not entirely breaking new ground that way. But um, no, I think what, what you say, with so many players, have been born after Good Friday Agreement. I mean, a lot of what they'd be hearing here, I could imagine them just rolling their eyes and thinking, you know, it's all history and we've no interest in that at all. And, you know, I was looking at this even in the book and so on, say, yeah, we all know the, the growth in the Northern Irish identity that yeah. is seen as, as the hybrid between you don't declare fully for Irish, you don't declare British, you declare your allegiance to this patch of land. And I was thinking that, I mean, that's a possibility for a much greater upsurge in support for the Northern Ireland team. And I suppose the the um, challenge there would be that um, the Northern Ireland team is then have to probably going to come up with symbols that reflect a Northern Ireland identity rather than a British identity. And and the, again, the symbols are the worst part of it because you, you can't start on negotiation with the symbols because the, the, they carry the greatest emotional charge and so on. But yeah, in, in answer to your question, I I think there would have been a time when it might have been you know considered laughable that the Northern Ireland soccer team could be seen as a, a way of easing cross community tensions. But I, I, don't, I don't think it's I don't think it's laughable now. I think I think there's. Definite potential there, yeah. Trevor? Yes, if only the fans had been born after 1990. <laughs> yeah. Because, of course, there's still residual yeah. ambivalence towards uh, members of the nationalist community. Yeah. Gary Armstrong, Martin Lane, great heroes. Mm. Uh, Neil Lennon and Antoine Rubin, who yeah. unfortunately, or yeah. they, unfortunately, were playing for the last facility. Yeah. The abuse they got. Yeah. Um, uh, and that, there's still reverberations of that sort of underlying, yeah. not least at the last international match, yeah, yeah. Uh, which was when played just after the Kismet Park issue came to foot before again, with the immortal, I better not forget, uh, you can stick your case with Park, etc. Which is something I can mind, by the way. Yeah. Um, so I, I was reminded then that there's still an underlying uh, disaffection almost yeah. Um, yeah. In, some, in some quarters, right? Or yeah. the idea of uh, an all-inclusive identity. Yeah, and just when you think it can't get any more complicated, along comes something like Caseman Park, yeah, sure. you know, to yeah. add a whole new layer of, of, okay. of complications. Yeah, that's what you're Just the interest of balance and the new line thing, of course, well known. What's not talked about so much is the abuse range of players receive it uh, in, when their teams are playing the Republican Yeah, Ireland. yeah, yeah. There's a whole list of that. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And, um, Someone like Pat Fenlon when he he played for, for Linfield, um, and he said, you know, he was very cordially received <laughs> at Linfield, but every time he went back to uh, to Dublin, he'd be roundly abused, you know. Um, so yeah, yeah, it, it cuts it cuts both ways, yeah. Question yeah. back. Yeah, how much the impact you have player part on possible countries? I mean, by We've seen Dark and Race um, playing, playing for the public, but then because of his ambition to be like a world star, he yeah. was England, and even yes. like Liverpool had a crown under his next team player, I don't know. Mm. I think that's it's something Dockery anyway, and mm. he does from Dark, and he says, considering he's now four years in, in England, the Panther of the Gallery, he may choose to play for England. Yeah. yeah. So if they all players start going for their own ambition to play for like, the countries more likely to win a World Cup. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I can't. I don't see anything shameful in that. As a professional footballer, you want to play at the the top level. And let's be honest, if most players had the choice between playing for the current England team 
Um, <laughs> you know, yeah, and you're you're able to do so. It's it's not a difficult it's not a difficult choice, you know, and <laughs> and particularly as a as a professional footballer. I mean, we you know you made the point about mercenary is an easy job, but if you want to play at the top level, um, and Rice, you know, seems to, and obviously Jack Grealish as well, yeah. Um, it was, wasn't Grealish a very talented Gaelic footballer and so on, you know? And, um, but I, I can't, I look at it, I, I can't really blame them, you know? Actually, Harry Kane, was, it wasn't Harry Kane eligible as well for, yeah. for the public, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jude Bellingham. Jude Bellingham, that's right. Hasn't he got an Irish passport now? Yeah. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's right. Um, yeah, God, if, if it was Jack's years now, and you, you had you had the pick of these players now. And again, you know, success attracts, doesn't it, you know? Um, so if you've got a better team, you get better players, you know? It, it seems to be the, the way it works. Peter? Is there any chance that there would be um, opposition from the international authorities, UEFA? Ah, yeah. So, because mm. we're talking as if, like, that, that's not an issue. And, like, I suppose it goes back to the... The original anomaly that was even an England team, because I guess yeah. I know mean, it's a sign in rugby again because of the fact that these games were invented in the wow. But I imagine soccer, rugby, football, where you're going to go, that could be more problematic. And it, does it set any precedent that the Catalans would love a team? I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. You know, so that there might be a reason why FIFA wouldn't want to. Would be very okay. careful about that. They might want to reunite them for that reason because they're the fewer teams then. Since the rest of the Yugoslavia, the more teams than they can put together. Yeah, I'm sure money would be very decisive for FIFA. But do you know what I'm saying? Very much, yeah. There's a precedence debate about Germany and those kind of things because that that was pretty significant. The fact that, you know, they won the World Cup immediately. Yeah, yeah. I don't think there were any East German players. Yeah, yeah. But is there any. So we've talked all about what's going on in the island. Is there a debate? Yeah, you, you would. That's relevant? You would obviously have to make sure that your your structures had the approval of FIFA. So th therefore, if you go for an international team, could you have the, the strengthening of an international team and separate leagues um, playing in, in in European competition, for example? I mean, it, the whole thing would be would be very fraught. I mean, it, it could probably be done. You know. Um, they, they, you might get a special dispensation or whatever, um, you know, for the international team. But, but it, it would be, it would be, it would be immensely complicated, you know. Yeah, it would be immensely complicated. Yeah. That came up as a final point in history of Europe only a handy point in the last state paper release. They released one on the um, potential move of Wimbledon to um, Northern Ireland in 1997-98. Um, and that issue came up of what, of a, a you know, a, of the interleague um, rivalry because you would have had a, a, a full, an English football yeah. association team playing in Irish football association territory. Now I know there's precedent with, say, Cardiff City mm. and things like that, and with Derry City playing yeah, in yeah. Ireland. Yeah. But you've not only the international bodies, you've all those mm. rivalries between the, the, the uh, local. Organizations, so that file is worth well worth a read. Okay, okay, right, yeah, keep my Look, anything online? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two questions online. So, first from Anthony, Andrew, Newman, 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 Talking off the top of my head, just speculating. I really don't. That talk about an imbroglio. Um, I don't know. I, I wish I could. I wish. Just you, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a, that's a that's a wisdom of Solomon sort of question, really. You know. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, even just the the level of um, opposition in the, in the south, where they see you know fifty million going to a stadium. Um, and you know, most League of Ireland clubs playing in absolutely appalling stadiums, you know. And so, yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? That's that's a tough one, yeah. 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 
Yeah, and then we had another one from Neil Jago. Greatly enjoyed your book, James. Was the standoff between Derry City FC and the IFA over the Brandywell as a European Cup venue in 1965 of wider political significance? Well, yeah, I think it was because it, um, for a lot of Derry fans, it showed that they they weren't being treated as well as most other clubs. I mean, it was often said that the the Brandywell, you know, it wasn't it wasn't a stadium of light, but it wasn't a, it wasn't a soccer slum either, you know, um, and that they per- perfectly could have had um, European Cup games there. So, in building up the level of of ill will, if you like, that eventually made Derry leave the league. Yes, I mean, I, I think it, cer- it certainly did. And again, the, you know, the terrible memories of what happened to Belfast Celtic are always lurk- lurking in the background. So there was an idea, I suppose, among clubs with a largely nationalist following that they weren't getting, um, they weren't getting a fair deal. Great. Any other questions? James? I was just going to say something about domestic payment, which is oh, the lovely. state of Euro 2016 in France. Is this kind of summer? Yeah. Of, do you sense the supporters yeah. in that state were trying to compete for the, the most charming? Yeah, 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 yeah. And yeah. that's behaved. You know, yeah. mm-hmm. Obviously, we're, we're still both under the line of football in Ireland. You know, that was a, there's, there's an alternate future. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that that was cheering for for everybody involved, you know. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and the, the, the and the way good behaviour has become such a, a central part, almost of the identity of um, fans like the Irish and the Scots and so on. Um, so um, yeah, that, that that's uh, that's an, an optimistic note, I think. Yeah, that, 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 yeah. Right. Uh, thank you very much, everyone. Um, just a reminder that, that James's new book is, is No Foreign Game, Association Football and the Making of Irish Identities, published by Irish, Irish Academic Press, available in paperback uh, at all good bookstores uh, for a reasonable, a reasonable mm-hmm. amount of money. So um, if uh, today's talk has uh, stimulated your interest in the subject, um, that's highly recommended. Um, so can we thank James for coming and sharing his uh, reports with us today? Uh, and then we have a couple more seminars before the Easter break. Uh, next Monday, uh, change of direction. Uh, we've got two speakers, uh, Molly Quinn Leach and Emer McHugh, both from Queens, uh, speaking on different aspects of Shakespeare and Ireland, or actually more specifically Shakespeare and Northern Ireland, uh, the kind of uh, culture of, of performance and production of Shakespeare in the North and also Kenneth Branagh and uh, the kind of different dimensions of national identity in Branagh's uh, Shakespeare uh, productions. Um, so that's next Monday at uh, 4.30 in this room. And then one final uh, seminar before the Easter break, uh, Pauline Colombier, uh, who's from the University of Strasbourg in France, uh, speaking uh, on a subject related to her recent book, um, the title for presentation is Women and Home Rule, Insights from Fictional and Non-Fictional Sources. Uh, so that'll be on the 11th of March, 4.30 in this room as well. Thank you all very much for coming and hopefully see you at one of those or a later event. Thank you. Thanks. Everyone.